Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Today we will start looking at uh, droplet burning. Now the context of droplet burning comes up in many liquid fuel applications. Um, many of the popular liquid uh, or commonly encountered liquid fuel combustion applications is in automobile engines where um, we um, inject either petrol or gasoline. Uh, as it is called in different countries uh, or diesel uh, in in, uh, in piston engines or uh, uh, for example some some form of kerosene in uh, aircraft engines and so on in in all these things the fuel is essentially the uh, essentially in the liquid form and it is atomized uh, into a spray and uh, the spray is essentially uh, composed of a ensemble of lots of different droplets of different sizes. Um, another uh, application of droplet combustion, uh, combustion is in liquid rockets where um, you typically are injecting a liquid fuel as well as liquid oxidizer and uh, you try to atomize both of them um, and uh, uh, to try to burn them. So in this situation then uh, 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 in general what basically happens is whichever is in liquid form uh, has to evaporate and uh, burn uh, in the gas phase and the combustion that is occurring in the gas phase has to feed back heat to the liquid uh, fuel or oxidizer uh, in, order, in, order, in order for it to vaporize. In the case of uh, liquid rockets where you have both liquid fuel and liquid oxidizer having to be atomized into sprays and the sprays have to mix and uh, vaporize and uh, burn together. You have a problem of multiple droplets of different species which are trying to vaporize based on flames that are existing while the gas phase products of these are um, gas phase vapors of these are mixing and burning and that is a little bit more difficult problem to think, think about. An easier problem is where you are looking at a fuel being in liquid phase and uh, being atomized into spray and uh, burning in a gaseous oxidi oxidizing ambience right. So first of all we will try to limit ourselves to this situation where only one of the um, reactants namely the fuel is uh, in liquid phase and uh, it, it vaporizes and, and its vapors mix with a gaseous oxidizing ambience right. So that is that, the first uh, limitation that we will set for ourselves. The second thing is we will not deal with sprays now um, we will deal with a single droplet so out, out of the spray. And whatever is the fate of the single droplet is something that we should expect uh, for all the droplets to face in a, in, a, in a ensemble of them that is constituting the spray if the spray is a dilute what is called as a dilute spray. So what is meant by a dilute spray is that the spray droplets are not interacting with each other in other words the combustion that is occurring in this in, in one droplet does not influence the vaporization of another droplet that is nearby and so on. This is typically what is called as a dilute spray and many times you do not necessarily have a dilute spray at all. You have uh, typically what is called as dense sprays where most of the combustion happens in droplet clouds as opposed to uh, happening on single droplets. But for the sake of convenience at the moment we will try to analyze a single fuel droplet burning in a gaseous oxidizing ambience. So this is the framework in which we want to do this. Having said that then we want to look at this essentially in the context of diffusion flames. Basically a droplet combustion essentially is, 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 is 
um, fundamentally a diffusion flame because you are talking about a fuel that is vaporizing and the vapors are mixing into the gaseous ambience just at the flame therefore there is no way you could have actually premixed the, the um, um, oxidizing vapor into the liquid droplet okay the li liquid droplet is uh, originally separate uh, and then the uh, and as it vaporizes its fuel vapors mix at the flame so it is essentially a diffusion flame. However there are uh, in certain liquid rockets typically smaller ones uh, we use something called monopropellant liquid uh, liquids or liquid monopropellants whichever way you want to call it uh, where the monopropellant uh, for example example is a hydrogen peroxide uh, which can actually burn by itself because it, ha it contains both hydrogen and oxygen within itself and as it thermally decomposes because of heating from a flame it gives rise to both fuel and oxidizer gaseous species that can, that can react at the flame and that would be a premix flame. Right. So, except for this particular situation we are essentially going to be looking at a liquid fuel droplet that is um, vaporizing and mixing with a gaseous oxidizing ambience at the flame forming essentially a diffusion flame. And since we are going to be looking at a diffusion flame we will actually look at what is happening at the Bergschumann limit which is uh, where the fuel and oxidizer vapors. Um, meet each other in the mixing field at stoichiometric proportions and therefore locate the flame corresponding to where the stoichiometric surface is in the mixing field similar to what we did for the Bergschumann flame. The general problem with most droplet combustion is to examine what is called as the what is popularly called the D squared law. So the, the starting point for us to actually look at is what is called as the D squared law. What, the, what this really means is that there is a certain rate of um, evaporation or uh, combustion of this um, droplet dictated by uh, how the droplet diameter changes with time okay. So you now take a certain droplet of a certain diameter at a particular time and ignite it and get it to combust or let us say it starts evaporating at a at, at time t naught then um, what this really means is if you now start with a uh, original diameter for the liquid droplet dl not squared uh, and then the diameter decreases to dl squared at any time t this is simply given by k times t minus uh, t not this is what is called as a d squared law. Now this is an empirical observation to begin with and uh, certainly for many different droplets you do not necessarily have to have a d squared law um, it could be d to the some power which is approximately around 2 okay. There are some uh, some situations where it could be as low as 1 uh, sometimes it, uh, and many times you do not necessarily fit in a integer for the power it could be a non integral number like let us say 1.5, 1.8 and so on. Now on the face of it what it really means is d when you say d squared it essentially refers to surface area okay. So what we can understand is more the surface area of the droplet greater is the evaporation right uh, or and, and evaporation leads to combustion in, in, a, in, a, in a combusting environment but whatever we are talking about will also be uh, valid for evaporation when you have a hot ambience. So what, what we are talking about could be thought of even, even in a non reacting sense where you have a hot ambience okay. So um, like for example you want to dry, um, um, dry a spray for example or dry droplets like for example if you get uh, hired by a washing machine company and you want to figure out how to design a dryer like for example droplets that are actually trapped in, uh, in, in a cloth how they get dried uh, depending upon of course you will have, you'll have to bring in convective heat transfer and so on. So you, you will have to think about all those uh, all the issues that we are talking about in, um, uh, in that context. So whatever we are talking about now will also be valid for evaporation in a, in a hotter ambience uh, than the liquid droplet temperature. So uh, and when we say d squared it re basically refers to surface area and as a matter of fact the, the goal of atomization is to actually try to enormously increase the surface area of the liquid from uh, originally like let us say a, a, a flow of bulk liquid you now want to actually spread it 
spread the surface area for the given same the same volume and uh, essentially then increase the surface area so that you will now increase the evaporation and therefore the combustion um, rate and so on. So the, the goal of the theory here is to see if we can look at um, the, the governing equations and deduce um, the d squared law by applying the governing equations to this particular geometry and this problem. So uh, obviously here uh, dl naught is essentially dl at uh, time t equals t naught and uh, t naught could be thought of as like a ignition delay beyond which the combustion begins and uh, k is what is called as the evaporation constant evaporation constant. So the framework here is we now assume that the droplet is spherical it is not a bad assumption uh, considering surface tension effects that try to keep the droplet spherical beyond um, below I should say below a certain certain size for, for, for a given uh, um, droplet uh, given liquid. Uh, so th this is not a very bad assumption at all like for example if you are looking at droplets that are of the order of 10 microns or even 100 microns they are reasonably spherical even in a gravitational field like what we face on earth. Um, and then uh, so this is the fuel and then what we expect is then there must be a concentric flame around it. Now this is a questionable assumption uh, in a um, gravitational field because buoyancy effects will induce a vertical convection upward and also distort the flame shape in, in, in a way that is uh, pointed upwards all right. Um, and of course what we are looking at is a is a droplet to be stationary in a quiescent oxidizing quiescent gaseous oxidizing ambience therefore um, we could now assume the spherical a spherical flame concentric to the droplet um, if the droplet were to be moving right uh, so that there is a motion for the droplet then the motion can correspondingly induce a distortion in the flame shape relative to the spherical shape that we have assumed. Uh, so that, that is not to be considered uh, in, in what we are assuming uh, what we what we are uh, taking up because we are saying it is quiescent ambience. So if you now have a concentric flame and this is the droplet right um, then we can we can say that the mass flow rate of the uh, uh, fuel that is coming out of the surface of the droplet is minus d over dt 4 over 3 pi r l cubed um, rho d where uh, rl is uh, the, the liquid um, I, should, I, should, uh, I should probably use a different subscripts here but, but I think it is a mix up of subscripts well just keep it as rl okay rl cubed and rho, rho, rho l where rl is the liquid radius and uh, rho l is the liquid density and um, now in this of course the liquid density is not expected to change with time and uh, 4, 4 by 3 pi is, uh, is constant therefore we can pull them out and then differentiate um, rl cubed with respect to time and uh, that is that is going to give you minus 4 pi rl squared um, rho l drl divided by dt. Um, the negative sign is because uh, as, as time increases r decreases okay. So uh, and then we want to have a positive mass flux that is coming out therefore you throw in a negative sign to make the make that out. So uh, what we now assume of course uh, here we have, we have already mentioned assume spherical symmetry um, not, a, not a great assumption for a moving droplets or in a gravitational field or both. Uh, the other assumption that is going to be quite important and needs to be elaborated upon is what is called as a quasi steady assumption. What that means is 
the uh, the droplet diameter does not significantly change when the droplet evaporates and the gaseous vapor moves away from the uh, droplet up to the flame and mixes with the ambience to form the form the uh, reaction in other words the the typical time scale of um, convection and diffusion of the uh, gaseous species is much smaller when compared to the typical time scale of reduction of the droplet size appreciably all right so how do i understand that uh, the the answer is essentially coming from the fact that the rho l could be significantly larger than the gaseous density okay so you, you, you can have a factor of about uh, 2 or 3 uh, so I should not say factor uh, sorry order of magnitude by about 2 or 3 like, like, like the, 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 the gaseous density is like of, of the order of 1 kilogram per meter cube the, uh, the liquid density could be of the order of 1000 kilogram per meter cube right so, so what the answer is we need to look at mass conservation across the interface right so for a uh, unit mass per volume of um, liquid to, to evaporate will, will now give rise to um, a much lower density which means uh, as the uh, as the surface recedes inward it is now going to put out gas that is that has to actually move radially outward at a significantly larger rate. So to give you an idea correspondingly if you now say that the gaseous velocity that is going to go out relative to our, our, our uh, um, frame of reference centered around centered at the droplet uh, center um, if, if, if that is of the order of let us say a few meters per second right then correspondingly the, the, the droplet rate of motion is going to be only a few millimeters per second right. So we, because you, you now have to have this uh, three orders magnitude two to three orders magnitude um, disparity between the, the, the rate of regression of this droplet surface inward to the rate at which the, the gases would evolve out of the uh, droplet. What this really means is a couple of things one first of all the, the, the droplet um, regression sets up a convection. So why will, why will, while we would like to think that it is purely a diffusion problem right. Uh, in fact when you think about it as a diffusion flame in the Berkshireman limit where we now adopt an infinite chemistry mixed as burnt approach um, flame sheet assumption and so on where we do not have to worry about the chemistry and we will have to worry about the mixing. So we would like to think that this is purely a mixing problem wherein the, the, the um, liquid um, vaporizes and the fuel vapor steps out of the liquid surface after the vaporization and is just sitting there to diffuse. No it is not sitting there it is actually flowing out because you have this regression right. But the second point that is actually being made is this which is the, the, the regression is so slow when compared to the rate at which the gases move away from the center with a with velocity such that we can now think of a droplet of a given radius at any particular instant as a snapshot that means you freeze frame your droplet and, and then say for this particular droplet diameter the gases are rather instantaneously moving out and diffusing with the oxidizing ambience forming the stoichiometric surface and hence the flame and, and then the heat is rather instantaneously moving back to this droplet of this particular size. So all this balance happening in the gaseous phase is rather instantaneous when compared to the droplet motion that we can freeze this picture right that is what is meant by quasi steady assumption that means as far as the gaseous uh, equilibrium is concerned the mass balance and the energy balance the species balance and the energy balance is concerned we can essentially say it is steady state we do not have to worry about any unsteadiness. So we now start with the uh, Schwab-Zeldovich formulation. The Schwab-Zeldovich um, formulation has its eleven assumptions, including a steady state, right? Which which we just try to articulate now. Uh, so the Schwab-Zeldovich uh, formulation
is uh, the operator L of beta equal to 0 where uh, beta um, is the coupling function and um, of course for n species that we have we are supposed to have n plus 1 um, uh, betas uh, of course uh, 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 sorry for, for n species that we have we have n betas and 1 alpha so we have n plus 1 equations uh, but if you, if you notice what we did earlier with the premix flame as well as the Berkshuman diffusion flame where we adopted the Schwarz-Schwarz-Zeldovich formulation earlier uh, in, in this course we now try to choose those particular alphas and betas in the schwab zeldovich formulation that is the most pertinent to what we are what we are doing so so we do not necessarily have to worry about n plus 1 equations right. So here what we want to do and, and this is actually the art of solving the problem so the take here beta equals the energy beta which is uh, um, should say identically uh, beta t which is equal to alpha t minus alpha o. Now I could have used alpha f to subtract uh, from any of the other alphas including alpha t or some other alpha some other species alpha right. So the choice of actually using alpha t and alpha o is because I want to actually keep track of the oxidizing uh, ambient species which is purely gaseous all right and then the temperature because the, uh, the temperature is very important because the, the energy balance is the one that is actually giving rise to a heat feedback that vaporizes the droplet. So if you did not factor in the heat feedback you are not going to be able to vaporize the droplet so you need to you need to have the energy balance number one and the oxidizing species is taken because it is purely gaseous I do not have any problem with uh, it, it vaporizing right. So alpha t minus alpha o is a is a good uh, combination that, that I can think about which will now translate to a t superscript naught um, to t integral cp dt divided by um, let us say the reference q uh, that is uh, based on the heat of uh, heat of formation uh, plus y o divided by um, w o nu o where of course o I should I should uh, mention here o refers to oxidizer oxidizer in the ambience right and uh, uh, L of beta is uh, basically divergence of uh, rho v velocity beta minus um, rho d divergence beta equal to 0 right this is something that we have written about 2 or 3 times now in, in solving different problems. In fact for the for the premix flame problem we had a one dimensional formulation uh, so it does not did not quite really matter but we, it, it is essentially one dimensional Cartesian. In the in the Berkshuman problem when we adopted the uh, schwab zeldovich formulation we we, co we wrote it for a two dimensional cylindrical polar coordinate system. It is now going to be back to a one dimensional situation because the only variation is going to be along the radius right. So well, but, but we are going to adopt a spherical polar coordinate system all right in, in a one dimensional sense where the radial, radial variation is the only thing that is considered and you and in a spherical polar coordinate system of r theta and phi we are we are going to have to get rid of phi and theta variations but still the r variation the one dimensional variation in r uh, is going to be in a spherical polar coordinate uh, framework therefore uh, in, in in spherical polar coordinates this can be written as uh, we get um, d by dr of uh, r squared rho v beta um, equal to d by dr of r squared rho d 
d beta by d r okay the r squared as a coefficient is special to the uh, spherical polar coordinates here uh, and, and notice that we have a double derivative here whereas we have only a single derivative here okay um, and uh, we are using ordinary derivative because r is the only uh, independent variable now so it is not necessarily a partial differential equation. Now we want to try to bring in this m dot which will rope in our RL which is the um, radius of the droplet at any particular time um, to any radius. So R is going to vary from RL to infinity all right and m dot is going to be m dot can be by the way m dot can be defined um, for any R for the mass flux of the gas but at the surface it is it has to match the liquid mass flux right. So m dot is essentially rho v times 4 pi r squared small v of course is the radial component of gaseous velocity right and rho is the gaseous density right or, or, or the density of the gaseous mixture in your in your in your domain the domain is now for the gas and so it starts from r equals rl to r equals infinity that is how it is going and uh, m dot is for any uh, any radius and that is that has to be a constant uh, in steady state okay what is it that is really what we do not know what we are basically looking for is what is the rate at which the droplet is evaporating if I knew what is the rate at which the droplet is evaporating I would know what is the rate at which the mass is coming out of the droplet surface and I would know what is the rate at which mass is flowing at any point r in the gaseous field and up to the flame and beyond and so on but that is what I do not know in that sense this is actually similar to the premix flame problem where what we are actually trying to find out is the rate at which the, fl the flame was propagating right we, do, we, did not, we did not know what the rate at which the flame was propagating at and that is what was setting up the convection right here again the m dot the mass flux which is, which is a constant right from the droplet radius to any other location or uh, in the gaseous field uh, is, uh, is the unknown and that is related to the velocity v which is setting up the convection, convective field for the gaseous flow right. So we want to make use of this uh, and uh, therefore what we want to do is so the point basically is you know whenever you see a r squared rho v right immediately what you want to think is can I throw in a 4 pi and then make it look like m dot and then utilize it to be a constant and then I can pull it out and then take it to the other side slip it into the derivative you can do all these kinds of things. So uh, this can now be written as d beta by dr is equal to d by dr of 4 pi r squared rho d divided by m dot times d beta by dr okay that looks better um, and we will, we will try to make it look even better by introducing a new dimensionless independent variable. So introduce dimensionless independent variable psi equal to m dot times r to infinity 4 pi r squared rho d to the negative dr to the negative 1 
uh, dr. Now what does that mean? You look at here you have a 4, four pi r squared rho d divided by m dot. So strictly speaking of course we could take this m dot inside the integral because it is a constant and what you are looking at is m dot divided by 4 pi r squared rho d okay. Since r squared is actually showing up in the denominator right we now have to end up integrating from r to infinity and that is the reason why we are taking up an alpha o or you can put it the other way I took an alpha o therefore I want to actually look at the, the, the uh, uh, region between any r and infinity as a measure of r okay. So this is a inverse thing as r keeps growing my psi is going to decrease because at infinity psi is going to go to 0 okay. So this is actually trying to invert r because r is showing up in the denominator here r as, as 1 over r squared right. Now this is these, these are some of the things that uh, are uh, puzzling about combustion theory which is uh, you, you come up with these um, uh, what should I say um, innovative ways of non dimensionalization which are, which are which is not very apparent to a, 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 a student who is not really well versed with mathematics um, but, but that is that is the game. Uh, the, these, this mathematics is typically so complicated that we will have to come up with these innovative non dimensionalization methods uh, that will try to simplify the governing equation significantly. So if you now adopt this, if this particular independent variable then you now transform your equations in terms of psi as opposed to r and uh, the, the governing equation. becomes the governing equation becomes um, d beta divided by d psi equal to minus d squared beta divided by d psi squared so simple because essentially all the well this is the only term that has a um, coefficient within the derivative and that is simply being robbed off by the, the definition of psi therefore that, that vanishes and you simply have d squared beta by d psi squared with a negative sign and uh, so essentially this is d squared beta by d psi squared plus d beta by d psi is equal to 0 right. So this is a uh, linear second order ordinary differential equation for which we know how to solve how to write the solution the solution is the solution is beta equal to a plus b e to the minus psi now let us call this 1 in fact this is where we are going to start doing the problem as of now we have not really done anything because the problem is always defined by the boundary conditions all right so strictly speaking I have not really said from here on when the mathematics started that I am working on the droplet problem okay. So the droplet problem is going to show up only when we start applying the boundary conditions right and the boundary conditions need to be applied in order to evaluate the constants of integration a and b which are coming up because we, are, we have solved we have just solved a second order equation so we have two um, we, we, we have two. Uh, boundary conditions that need to be provided in order to solve for this and keep in mind we do not quite know psi as well it involves m dot that is the unknown okay. So in that sense this is kind of like an eigenvalue problem and as I said it is a it is a uh, it is very similar to the premix flame problem where we do not know the propagation speed and that was an eigenvalue in that problem and in order to evaluate that besides applying boundary conditions um, there we also applied an interface condition between two regions the preheat zone and the and the, uh, the reaction zone and uh, the interface condition was the one that actually fetched us the um, um, eigenvalue namely the flame speed. Here we will also have to have an interface condition at this at, at the liquid surface um, which is now trying to say so much of evaporation is happening for so much heat that is being sent right. So in, in addition to 
applying boundary conditions in the gaseous phase at R equals uh, uh, um, uh, RL which is the liquid surface and R equals infinity we will also have to supply an interface condition in order to evaluate the M dot um, this is what we will try to do. So need uh, boundary conditions for uh, beta and psi right. So the first uh, boundary condition is uh, so you have to go back and see what, what, this, what, what is beta beta is alpha t minus alpha o alpha t is this which pertains to energy balance right and alpha o is this which pertains to y o which is the mass fraction of oxidizer right. So if you are now able to actually generate boundary conditions at r equals r l and r equals infinity for y o um, and temperature or energy balance then we subtract the one from the other in order to find the boundary condition for beta. So this is the process that we are going to do. So as far as the species is concerned what we know is that the oxidizer cannot penetrate the liquid surface all right. Now this is something that need not necessarily be true but the moment you now are able to um, suppose that you have a liquid droplet which is intact and it is going to produce gaseous fuel means that the oxidizer does not really the, the gaseous oxidizer does not penetrate the, the uh, liquid okay. Now there are more complicated situations where typically one of the products of combustion so what is going to happen to the products of combustion so you are going to have the products being formed at the flame right and just like how we thought about the, the flame as a flame sheet in the Berkshuman problem and we tried to actually locate how the temperature, um, uh, uh, temperature profile and the product concentration profile would vary away from the flame on either side and of course the fuel concentration oxide as a concentration plunging in at the flame uh, and, and so on we could think about it like that. So what we would expect is as the products are being formed at this flame they are at a high concentration relative to the neighborhood and therefore they would have a tendency to diffuse right. So they would diffuse inward against the current in this case as well as outward right when they diffuse in and of course the temperature is also going to be at its peak at the flame and it is going to come down so it comes down on both sides and uh, as uh, while it goes out there it is going to match the oxidizer temperature in the far field but it is going to ma match the surface temperature of the liquid which could be like the boiling point of the liquid right and then of course inside the droplet you could have a constant temperature if the droplet is too small so thermal equilibrium must happen significantly considering that liquid thermal conductivities are an order more than the gaseous thermal conductivity and so on or let us say if you have a still a profile that is going in but at the temperatures of boiling point of the liquid the product could also condense into a liquid okay. So examples of this are for example if you now think about aluminum which is used widely in solid rockets where you have a molten liquid aluminum droplet that is burning vaporizing into vapor phase aluminum or, or aluminum vapor and mixing with oxidizing species of course in the solid rocket you do not really have atmospheric oxygen kind of thing you have oxidizing species in the form of water and carbon dioxide and so on which carry oxygen atoms in them and they, they, they mix and then form a flame and the product of combustion is Al2O3 right and in gaseous state because the temperatures are so high that it would be even higher than the um, vaporization temperature of Al2O3. So you form aluminum oxide vapor at the flame which now tries to diffuse out uh, from the flame radially inward and radially outward and a little bit further out the temperatures are now lower enough 
for the Al2O3 vapor to condense into Al2O3 liquids. The, the vaporization temperature of Al2O3 is significantly higher than the, the melting point of aluminum therefore as the Al2O3 is diffusing backwards or inwards it is now going to begin to condense and then as it comes down closer it now starts reaching the aluminum droplet surface. Keep it aside look at another example let us think about things like methanol or ethanol droplets right and in this case you can you could easily think about an oxidizing ambience made of just atmospheric oxygen right uh, or, or pure oxygen or air whatever and then you have a flame and uh, the products of combustion are carbon dioxide and water which try to diffuse but as the water one of the products comes back diffusing in it now condenses because when methanol exists as methanol um, it is quite volatile right so it, it can vaporize but the temperatures for the combustion are so high somewhere in here as the as the water vapor diffuses back in it can it can condense right and then further in it now finds the surface of methanol. Now the difference between these two situations of aluminum combustion and methanol combustion is in one case the product liquid that is condensed is immiscible with the parent uh, molten uh, aluminum fuel droplet whereas in the case of methanol the product water that has got condensed is miscible with the reactant fuel in, in liquid form. So as the water actually comes back in it starts mixing with um, water in liquid phase and effectively dilutes the fuel. So as the combustion continues to progress you get to a point where you are less and less rich in methanol and therefore as the and, and so, so what, what effectively the flame is trying to do is not only vaporize the methanol but also tries to vaporize the water that is mixed with it beyond a point it is got not getting enough methanol to burn and it, so the flame is going to extinguish uh, at a certain, a certain size of this droplet including having a certain amount of methanol as a residue along with water right. As opposed to that if you now look at aluminum since the aluminum oxide is immiscible in aluminum because of interface tension forces similar to surface tension effects all the aluminum oxide that is coming in cannot really stick at different points so they tend to actually accumulate to one side and they form what is called as a oxide lube or on one side it could be any side because we are not looking we are not really necessarily looking at effect of gravity here right so for, for, for very tiny droplets so it could be on one side and this is going to first of all spoil your spherical symmetry right but it could still assume cylindrical symmetry about the lobe uh, uh, center right so there is an axis and then the flame is now going to assume a shape that is cylindrically symmetric or axisymmetric and then as the more and more combustion happens the, the aluminum part shrinks and the, the oxide lobe grows and uh, so you now have a, a towards the later part of combustion of the droplet you have a smaller aluminum droplet and a larger lobe and ultimately when, when all of the aluminum is burnt the lobe closes and becomes a oxide droplet right. So that is the final product. So in, in both the cases you get a, a liquid, liquid product all right but in one case it is contaminated by some of the fuel that has got quenched with, 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 without the flame being able to sustain in the other case you get this and of course when you have an oxide lobe um, and, and, and if you are now beginning to think about a flow field uh, it becomes unstable and then it can start wobbling and, and so on so this is actually in reality a lot more complicated problem. The point I am trying to make is there are these problems where we would expect either the oxide to come and collect to one side or penetrate. In, in liquid form okay penetrate the uh, surface in liquid form and mix whereas that is not necessarily the case with ox oxygen 
Okay, if that was the case, then even as the liquid exist, liquid fuel existed, the the oxygen would begin to actually get dissolved in it, right? So the first thing that we have to adopt is that oxidizer cannot penetrate the liquid, the droplet surface. oxidizer cannot penetrate the droplet surface that is rho v y naught minus rho d d y naught by d r at r equals r l equal to 0. This is to say that the oxygen or the oxidizer the, the gaseous oxidizer can diffuse only up to the point that the droplet surface vacates by convection. So rho v times 4 pi r squared is m dot and that would be the same as this m dot right. So as far as the gaseous convective effect is concerned this is because of the space vacated by the droplet trying to um, regress in its surface. So the diffusion is trying to match the droplet regression right. So the droplet regression in terms of convection of the oxidizing gaseous species is this and this is the diffusion. So this basically states that the diffusion can happen just as much as the um, convection can allow it due to the droplet surface regression. So this is essentially the uh, uh, boundary condition here and this is in terms of R but we have adopted a non dimensionless independent variable psi. So uh, this basically means that this is similar to the flux boundary condition that we had uh, we, we had seen when we were considering uh, axial diffusion of the Berkshman problem by the way right quite similar there and uh, d d y o divided by d psi at r equals uh, psi equals psi l is equal to minus y o at psi equals psi l which can simply be called as minus y o l where y o l is the oxidizer concentration at the drop at the liquid droplet surface. What we expect is the oxidizer concentration to be in stoichiometric proportions with the with the uh, fuel concentration at the flame all right and further decrease to a, a value y o l. In combustion you will have the situation where the oxidizer is getting, getting consumed in the flame. In evaporation you do not worry about a flame it is just the heating from the outside that, that, is, that is causing the evaporation and you will still have a ambient gas trying to diffuse up to the droplet surface and hold a certain concentration there right. So this essentially is the oxidizer concentration at the liquid droplet surface. We do not know it quite but we may have to make an estimate we will worry about these things as we try to plug in some numbers or our uh, typical values for these things uh, as, we, as we go along. But right now the boundary condition needs to be formulated to describe the droplet combustion problem. So that is that is as far as um, one boundary of one component of alpha O right then we have to worry about what happens to alpha T at R equals RL corresponding ones at infinity and so on we construct these boundary conditions and the interface condition plug them in into the solution in order to find out m dot that is essentially what we want to do we will do that tomorrow.